Well, thank you very much for that um, wonderful segue into the weird world of spying that I'll be talking about this afternoon. I'd um, just like to thank Tatiana and Axiom as well for organising this wonderful event and for inviting me to speak here. Um, I've just discovered a new phrase I'm going to use now, which is identity hopping, because I started my working life as a British intelligence officer, um, and now I wear a variety of different professional hats. Um, and I suppose I can break those down into four different areas. I call them my wars on concepts, which are the war on drugs, the war on terror, the war on internet freedoms, and the war on whistleblowers. And today I want to focus mainly on the last one, the ongoing war on whistleblowers, and what we can do to help them, what we can do to help them continue to subvert the system. Because in my view, they are the regulators of last resort in a world which is going to shit very quickly. It's war. It is. <laughs> it's a version. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences going into working in and then escaping from the heart of British intelligence, just to give you a bit of a, a set feel for how the systems work. Um, but then I want to talk about some of the lessons learned and also some of the things that now I'm working on and that I hope more and more people will work on to actually produce something that will be networked disruption. So, um, just to set the scene, I want to tell you a little bit about the British intelligence setup. Now, up until about two years ago, probably very few people knew anything about it beyond James Bond. Thanks to a certain Mr. Edward Snowden, uh, we now know a lot more about what our spies get up to and how egregious their work has become over the last couple of decades. So, in the UK, we have four British intelligence agencies. Can anyone name them? G something, yeah. <laughs> GCHQ. And we also have something called the NCA, the National Crime Agency. So when people talk about the UK spy system, they always draw analogies with the US spy system, which actually sort of was based on the UK one. So MI6 is the Foreign Intelligence Gathering Agency, so it's the equivalent of the CIA. GCHQ, as we all now know, is the sister agency to the NSA, no such agency, or whatever it used to be called, um, in, the, in the US. And what would be the equivalent of the FBI? Well, most people always say it's MI5, but actually it is indeed now the National Crime Agency. They are uh, police, they have executive powers, and they work on exactly the same areas of interest. So I have to ask myself now, well, what exactly is the purpose of MI5? It seems to be a sort of anachronistic hangover from the glory days of the British Empire. And it is a very secret organisation that is working on police-type work, but with no oversight, and which has, for decades, investigated illegally their fellow British citizens for democratic um, activity. So I just want to talk a little bit more about them, because that was the agency I was recruited to work in. Now, I'm going to tell you some ancient history. Again, I'm a, an old person in this movement because I was actually approached to work for them back in 1990, a long, long time ago. Uh, just to give you a little bit of history, the British agencies have been around for 100 years, just over. They were set up in the run-up to the First World War to work against German espionage, ironically. Um, and for the first 80 years of their existence, they didn't officially exist. So they were off the books. There were no laws covering them. The uh, people in the Parliament could not ask questions about what they were getting up to. They were completely unaccountable. Now, this went on for a long time until a series of, ironically, whistleblowing scandals throughout the 1980s, the most famous being that of a book called Spy Catcher, which was written by a man called Peter Wright, a former senior MI5 officer. And this caused a huge international scandal. Now, because of this, a new law was put in place. And this was not to protect national secrets. This was actually put in place to prevent whistleblowers. And just to be a bit boring legally, in 1911 they put a law in place called the Official Secrets Act, which is there to uh, prosecute traitors, people who sell their national secrets to an enemy power. Now, this is still in place, this can still be used against traitors. But the 1989 Official Secrets Act was put in place after Peter Wright and Spycatcher, specifically to criminalise people who blow the whistle on the spies. And under this law, it means that if you say anything ever to anyone outside the agencies about your work, you will automatically be prosecuted and you will automatically face two years in prison. Um, so I was recruited a year after this law came into being. Crucially, in the same year, another law came into being called the Security Service Act, 
which actually put MI5 on a legal footing for the first time, <laughs> which meant if they wanted to do things which would otherwise be illegal under UK law, they were allowed to, but only if they got the prior permission from their political master, the Home Secretary. MI6 and GCHQ were then made legal in 1994 with the Intelligence Service Act. Now I mention this because this will come up later in the story. So how did I become a spy? Well, I sort of fell into it by accident, as, as most spies do. Um, I actually quite fancy being a diplomat, swanning around embassy parties, drinking champagne. Well, that was my image when I was 20. The reality, by the way, is very different. If you're lucky, you get a plastic cup with some cheap white warm wine. <laughs> so I applied to the Foreign Office, and a couple of months later, I had this strange letter from the Ministry of Defence saying there may be other jobs you would find more interesting. If you are interested, please phone this number. And I looked at it, and my very first gut instinct was, oh fuck, it's MI5. Now, I don't know why, because, you know, why not I would think that? And I was really frightened, though, because at that point, after the whistleblowing scandals of the 1980s, they had a filthy reputation. They were seen to be people who um, broke strikes, um, oppressed trade unionists, oppressed political activists, and, of course, they were the whistleblowing scandals. So my instinct would be to ignore the letter. There is no way I wanted to go and work for a world like that. Unfortunately, I opened the letter when my father was next to me. And he, unfortunately, was an investigative journalist and also a huge spy geek. He loved the novels of John le Carre. <laughs> so if you can imagine his response, with my indiscreet and very ladylike um, comment. And he just said, oh, please, Annie, just ring it up. I'll ring up the number, see if it is MI5, see if you're right. So ever afterwards, I've been able to blame my father for everything else that went wrong, which is a very good position to have. <laughs> anyway, so I rang up these people, and um, they said, come over for an interview. And I found myself a month later in this unmarked office building in the centre of London, being quizzed about my life from the age of 12 onwards. This interview went on for three hours. And it was very in-depth. It was, you know, what are your political beliefs, your ethical beliefs? Um, what about religion? What about sexuality? Okay. And then about halfway through this process, I was asked, why do you think you're here? And I said, well, um, are you MI5? I was really embarrassed because I thought, if I'm wrong, I'm going to look like such a tit. And um, this woman said to me, yes, actually we are. If you want to continue this, please sign this piece of paper now. And that was my official notification of the Official Secrets Act. By now I was thoroughly intrigued. So I did sign and I did continue. And this process went on for a further 10 months with different um, exercises and, and days of assessment and a positive vetting, of course, to make sure I wasn't a closet communist or something. And um, all the way through, every single stage, I was entirely honest about my views, my ethical framework and things. We would have debates about, do you think torture is right? No. Do you think you can imprison people without trial? No. Um, and I was very honest because I thought, well, these are MI5, they're bound to know everything about me anyway. And I kept getting through to the next stage. And they kept reassuring me and saying, we aren't the way we are portrayed in the media. We now have to obey the law because of the Security Service Act. Um, we share your ethical framework. We don't use torture. We don't use internment, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> they also said very crucially that they were looking for a new generation of intelligence officer. Because up to that point, they'd been focusing on counter-espionage, mainly against the Soviet Union, and um, also political subversion, as they called it, which is investigating people for their political beliefs, left and right wing. They said, we don't do that anymore. The Cold War's over. This is 1990. Um, come and work for us. We need people to work on terrorist operations. Most particularly at that point, the bombing campaign of the provisional IRA. Um, and they were a very sophisticated terrorist group. They could put bombs down pretty much at will across UK streets, and they did. So all this accumulated into quite a nice feeling about this place. Plus, my recruiter was so unexpected. She looked like a hippie, um, you know, hair down to her bottom, flared skirts, the whole thing. She did not look like your usual spy image. And I found that quite reassuring as well. It turned out that the people that she recruited always had um, a were stigmatised as mavericks in the office. I don't know why, but anyway, she obviously went for the weird ones. Anyway, after 10 long months, finally I got the letter saying, yes, please come and work for us. And all I knew at this point was the grade I was going in at, which in those days was GD5, tells you a lot, and my pay. 
which I won't embarrass everyone by telling, because it was just so low, and it still remains relatively low, I gather. But people don't go into this work for the money, they go into it because they think it's an interesting job, it will make a difference, and potentially even save lives. So that was all I knew when I tripped into the office the first day in January 1991. And we went through our training and then we were assigned our posts. Now after all this, and all this reassurance and this long process, imagine my surprise when the first posting I was given was to a little section called F2, which was, indeed, political subversion. So I was there for two years in charge of trying to investigate micro-Trotskyist groups for their supposed threat to British national security. In fact, my uh, core group that I investigated was called the Socialist Workers' Party. Now, they weren't even subversive. They actually believed in the democratic process of changing people's minds and promoting, through education, a revolution, a reform of the system. So for two years, I spent my time trying to shut down the study, closing down the telephone intercepts that were on the private personal lines of UK citizens, one of whom, by the way, was a very famous investigative journalist, purely for their political beliefs. It was during this time as well that I met my former partner, who became a very notorious whistleblower in the late 1990s, a man called David Shaler. And he was working at that time to investigate the anarchist threat to British national security, which you can imagine sort of only tended to start when the pubs closed at 11 o'clock at night in those days. So, <clears throat> I was there for two years. We managed to shut down a lot of the study. But crucially, we did see some things that concerned us. In fact, working in that section gave us a very historic perspective on the abuses that MI5 had been involved in for decades, the sheer scale of their investigation into their fellow citizens for their political activities. They had files on hundreds of thousands of people in the UK. They've aggressively investigated them. And when I say aggressively, I mean they had telephone taps, they were reading their letters, they were sending human agents into their meetings, they were following them around. And the other thing we saw as well was the fact that they kept files on people who were in Parliament. Anyone who stood as a representative in Britain automatically had their name checked against MI5's records. And if they had a file, that file was pulled out and reviewed by us. And we had to write whether or not this person would be a threat if they were elected to Parliament or, God forbid, to the government. And it was amazing, because this was back in 1992. And slews of files were coming out of the registry that we had to read. All these people who weren't terribly famous at that point, but rolled forward to 1997, and there was a Labour landslide, a Labour victory in the general election. And suddenly, anyone who was anyone in the Labour government, in fact, had an MFI file. So we saw names of, we saw the files of Tony Blair down, anyone who'd been in the cabinet, Jack Straw, who was the Home and Foreign Secretary, um, Patricia Harman, uh, Patricia Hewitt, Harriet Harman, uh, Robin Cook, the late Foreign Secretary, uh, Peter Mandelson, anyone who was anyone had files held on them. And it's hard to imagine, looking at New Labour and that government, that at some time in their radical youth they had seemed to be a threat to British national security. They were the most centrist, corporatist, socialist government we'd ever had in the UK. But I think this is a concern in a democracy because these politicians knew that MI5 held files on them. They weren't allowed to see them. So every time MI5 asked for new resources or more powers or more staff, of course, they were falling over themselves to grant MI5 their every wish. And you have to wonder why. It's the tail wagging the dog in a democracy. So this was our first disillusionment, shall we say. David and I both then worked in two other sections. We were in MI5 for a total of six years each. So we worked in the Irish section and then international terrorism as well. Now I won't go too much into the Irish, there's a lot of detail there. But there are a number of bombs um, that the provisional IRA planted on British streets that could and should have been prevented by MI5 and by the secret police. And mistakes were made, the bombs exploded, the IRA won huge PR victories and also people were injured and some of them died. Now, of course mistakes can be made. I'm not saying you know, the intelligence agencies have to get it right every single time, they are not human. But the key thing here is that they then lied to the government to cover up these mistakes and they shut up any dissent from the people who were running the operations who were concerned about these mistakes. So they just carried on making the same errors. But it was in our third posting that we saw the things going really seriously wrong and this is why after this posting, we resigned in order to blow the whistle, literally go on the run around Europe, and uh, go through all the various court cases. 
So first of all, um, in G branch it was called, this is international terrorism. David was appointed to be the head of the Libyan section at that time. Um, I was working uh, in gathering, uh, doing briefs for the government, so I had a very good overview about all the operations in G branch. Now there are three key operations that worried us. First of all, there is an illegal telephone tap on a very famous Guardian journalist. The Guardian is a very left-wing newspaper in the UK, or it used to be, less so now. And this was an illegal telephone tap. And it went on for about six months, and it cost the taxpayer about three quarters of a million pounds before David was able to shut it down. There was also a case of a car bomb that exploded outside the Israeli embassy in London in 1994. <coughs> Um, and this was a very sophisticated device that ate up all the forensics itself. Now, even the, the IRA couldn't make bombs like that. And two people, two young Palestinian students, were arrested and they were tried and they were convicted of conspiracy to cause that attack. It was all based on very circumstantial evidence. And they had a cast iron alibi for the day of the attack, so they were only done for conspiracy. However, they still got 20 years in prison each. And the reason that went ahead is because MI5 withheld crucial information, crucial evidence, that should have proven their innocence. So these people went to prison and served almost 20 years in prison because MI5 withheld the paperwork they should have disclosed during their trial. But the case that made us quit, this became the very notorious case, which was, became known as the uh, Gaddafi assassination plot. Now, of course, this seems rather quaint now. You know, after the um, CIA MI6-sponsored rebellion in uh, Libya in 2011 and the subsequent assassination of Gaddafi, all done in the glare of the media, what we saw in the 90s seems rather old-fashioned. But as I said, David was the head of the Libyan section in MI5, and he built up an unusually close working relationship with his counterpart in MI6, whose uh, James Bond number was not 007, it was PT-16B. Not quite as snappy. <laughs> And um, because of this, he was briefed all the way through as this plot unfolded. So in 1995, PT-16B asked to meet Dave face to face. He didn't trust even our secure telephones. And he said that there had been a volunteer, a walk-in, as they're called, into the British Embassy in Tunis. And this walk-in, who became codenamed Tunworth, said he was a senior Libyan military intelligence officer and that he, he was planning a coup against Colonel Gaddafi, but he needed help. Could he speak to the local MI6 officer and uh, help get some funding with the money? And MI6 got terribly excited about this, and with very few background checks, they started throwing money at this group. They would meet Tunworth in different embassies across Europe over a period of months, giving him suitcases of money. Now, MI6 was very excited about this, because at that point, one of their key priorities was to try and get the two wanted men for the Lockerbie bombing in 1998, over to the UK for trial. They kept failing, they kept failing. Tumworth offered them the two Lockerbie suspects in return for their help. He also offered some nice, fat, juicy oil contracts, apparently, for when he'd seize power in Libya. British petroleum would go back into Libya. So MI6 was terribly excited. Anyway, they told David about this. Um, he was very concerned, but he sort of thought initially, well, this is them trying to be James Bond. They're always coming up with these mad plans to do something weird, but they never usually go ahead and carry out the plans. So again, he was very surprised when in early 1996, he was sitting in his desk, and all this intelligence started to come across from different sources, saying that had been an attack against Gaddafi. And he had been driving in a cavalcade of cars when an explosion went off under a wrong, wrong car, obviously, because Gaddafi survived to be assassinated in 2011. But innocent people were killed in that car, and innocent people were then killed in the shootout um, around the crowd with his uh, guards. So I think in total 11 people were estimated to have died that day. So David, of course, went back to PT-16B and said, well, was this what you were talking about? And he said, apparently, with a note of triumph in his voice, yes, we did it, that was our man. Of course, they hadn't done it, they hadn't eliminated Gaddafi, and they had killed innocent people. And it then emerged as well that they crucially had not got the written permission of their political master, the Foreign Secretary, ahead of this operation, which, now they were had to obey the law, was the only thing that would give them immunity from prosecution if they did something illegal abroad. So what we're looking at is an operation where it's illegal under UK law, it's illegal under all international law, you're not allowed to assassinate foreign heads of state, and it went wrong and killed innocent people. We couldn't think of anything more heinous. We had not joined up with the British intelligence community to be part of a community that carried out state-sponsored terrorism, and that's what Britain had become by doing this. So we resigned. 
and we decided to go public. David took documents to do this. We knew what we were risking. Um, under the Official Secrets Act, we would immediately, if they caught us, be imprisoned, held on remand for up to two years, and of course convicted of a breach of the OSA. So we resigned and we decided to blow the whistle, and David made contact with a journalist. Now this is going back a long time. We didn't have the internet, we didn't have WikiLeaks, unfortunately. We had to do everything through the mainstream media. And it took a long time to set the whole thing up, 10 months, because David was suspicious that the journalist might shop him, and the journalist was suspicious that it might be an MI MI5 sting operation to plant fake intelligence into the press. So it was a very slow courtship. Finally, in the summer of 1997, we had the fateful phone call that the story was going to run in three days' time, it's like, and our entire lives would be turned inside out. So at that point, we packed two small bags, and we fled the country. We actually flew out of the UK the morning of the day the story was printed. We just got out in time. So I think probably David Shaler, myself, and um, Edward Snowden are the only three intelligence whistleblowers I can think of, that correct me if I'm wrong, who have preemptively pre gone on the run before the story hits the media. Um, and we were literally on the run for a month around Europe. We flew to the Netherlands. Um, then we went all the way down to the far southwest of France, right across down to Spain. It was like a sort of surreal backpacking holiday with MI5 and the Metropolitan Police chasing after us like the Keystone Cops across Europe. After a month of this, I decided to go back to the UK because I hadn't actually said anything in public at that point. I was just David Shaler's girlfriend. I knew I'd be arrested despite that, and indeed I was picked up at Gatwick Airport as I flew into London at the immigration desk and taken off to a terrorism interview suite at a central London police station where they grilled me for about six hours. They never charged me with anything because I hadn't done anything wrong. Um, but they kept me on police bail for another six months, which meant I had to keep going back and answering bail, month after month after month. During the time when we were actually on the run as well, they had gone into our home in London and conducted what they call, and this sounds fairly civilised, a counter-terrorism style search of our home. In reality, what that meant is they had ripped it apart. I don't know what they thought they'd find. There was no documentation, of course, that they could find. But what it meant was that they ripped up the carpets, they ripped up the floorboards, they ripped the bath apart, they pulled the pipes out, they smashed furniture, they slashed furniture. And they even went through my underwear drawer and left everything lying around. It was really creepy, because some of these guys I'd worked with. So um, this is partly why I had to go back to the UK, to sort out our home, pack it up. I also had to go back to comfort our traumatised families, because at that point, they had had no warning of what we were going to do because we could not trust our communications. We couldn't tell them on the telephone what we were planning. So the first they saw of it, of course, was the front pages of the newspapers. And um, it was sort of heart attack time all around, virtually. During the time when I was in the UK, um, David found a little French farmhouse in the middle of nowhere, which became our home for the next 10 months. We lived literally in hiding, very primitive, uh, where we couldn't have a car, we couldn't have a television, we couldn't have anything that you'd have to register. So it was about a mile away from the nearest hamlet and 10 miles away from the nearest town. So we did a lot of walking over that year. And during that time, we were negotiating with the government for David to come back to the UK to give his evidence about all the most serious crimes that we witnessed in order to create um, a scandal so that there would be an inquiry and a push from government to reform the spies and what they were getting up to. We wanted to bring them further under democratic control. We wanted proper oversight and we wanted them to obey the law. Unfortunately, to this day, they have refused to hold a proper inquiry into the David Shaler allegations and have continued to dismiss him as just a fantasist, despite the fact that other information came out substantiating the Gaddafi plot from other intelligence agencies and also from some of the other disclosures. Anyway, after 10 months of this, we went back to the newspapers and said, look, you've got to do something really big with the Gaddafi plot. Let's do this. And um, we went up to Paris and we met with the journalists and the story was about to break, and that's when the British spies <coughs> caught up with us. We were in a hotel room. David went out to watch football, I think, on television. He was taking this terribly seriously. And was about to come back. I was waiting for him to come back to the hotel room. And suddenly there was this sort of loud knock on the door. It's always five. If you ever hear five knocks on the door, you know you're in trouble. That's what the, they always do. <laughs> and I opened the door, and there were three French secret police officers there. And they said, we have Monsieur Shaler downstairs. 
So well, you know, you, you're arresting him. No, no, we're taking him away for questioning. Do you have his passport? No. And that was the last I saw of him. I didn't see him again for over two months. He disappeared into the French legal system. And he was held under very strict secrecy laws because the British had said to the French authorities, we want to extradite him because he is a traitor selling secrets to an enemy power. Now, when the British finally handed over the paperwork for the court case, the French saw that actually what he was was a whistleblower. And he wasn't selling secrets to an enemy power, he was talking to the media. And now under French law, and we knew this, if you are a whistleblower, you cannot be extradited because they deem it to be a political act and you are therefore safe. So finally, after almost four months in prison, David was released. So I always say thank you to the French at this point. <coughs> and you know, if anyone ever wants to consider whistleblowing, unless they have really changed the law significantly, France is a very good place to run. <laughs> anyway, so he was released. We then lived much more openly in Paris. Um, and again, you know, if you're going to live in exile, I seriously reckon men that about that city. <laughs> we were there for about two years, where we got more of the information out. It was a very gradual process. And um, finally, after that, still no inquiry, David decided to voluntarily return to the UK in 2000, knowing that he'd be arrested, knowing that he would have to stand trial and he'd probably be convicted under the Official Secrets Act, but wanting his day in court in order to read in all this evidence to the public record. So he returned in the summer of 2000, and um, we were expecting a very swift trial, because he was only ever charged with the very low-level disclosures, things like the files on government ministers. They specifically did not charge him with disclosing the Gaddafi plot. They wanted to keep that out of the public record. Um, and in order to do that, they took us through two years of pre-trial hearings, went on you know, case after case after case, and every time a legal ruling was made, it narrowed down and narrowed down what David was allowed to say when he came to trial. So in fact, when he did appear in front of a jury, eventually in October 2002, he wasn't allowed even to breathe the word Gaddafi because he would have been condemned, uh, done for contempt of court. Um, in fact, the whole of the British media, for the duration of the six weeks of the trial, was not allowed to mention the Gaddafi plot, even though it had been all over the British media for the previous four years, because they thought it might sway the jury whether or not they should convict David Shaler. So um, it was a bit of a kangaroo court. It was very Kafkaesque, standing up there, not being able to say why you'd done what you'd done, or mention the most serious disclosures. So inevitably, he was convicted. The only time either of us was ever officially allowed to say anything was after his conviction, but before he was sentenced, when he was facing, at that point, three different charges, which would have meant six years in prison. And I, I went up and um, I gave what they call a mitigation plea. And that was the only time either of us could say why we'd done uh, what we'd done. So I explained. <clears throat> and the judge actually eventually sentenced David to six months in prison. That was all, but it's bad enough. And he said in his final ruling that he accepted that Shayla had, not, had done what he'd done in the public interest. He accepted that there had been no financial motivation whatsoever in his whistleblowing. And he accepted that no lives had been put at risk by what he'd done either. And I thought, well, you know, that's something. And six months isn't too bad. <clears throat> Unfortunately, then, the next morning, all the headlines from the journalists who were sitting in the courtroom, as close as the front row is to me here, and I was watching them write down the ruling. The headlines said precisely the opposite, which was, Shayla sells agent lives down the river for money. And I was like, where the hell did that come from? So he sent, spent his time in prison. He paid his debt to society. We eventually produced a book together, which I came out in my name, which I had to give to MI5 to have it cleared. Otherwise, I would be convicted of a breach of the Official Secrets Act. But that's why I can talk openly about all this information without being prosecuted because it is in a cleared, authorised book. So it was all um, a bit of a sort of helter-skelter experience. David and I, after all that, sadly parted in 2006, um, not really in contact with him. But I think both of us learned some very interesting lessons, and that's really what I want to go on to now, um, looking forward with whistleblowing today. Now, first of all, I think uh, it became very clear to me that you cannot trust the mainstream media, not necessarily because bad people work there, but because of the, the forms of control and manipulation that the spies and the spin doctors in government can exert over our media. For example, the headline after David's conviction, which was precisely the opposite to what the judge had officially said. So I started looking at, well, how does this work? And in Britain, there is soft power. 
where <coughs> they invite journalists into the sort of secret, charmed world and give them briefings. And the journalists become dependent on these briefings to get their stories. It's a bit like a junkie. And um, then sometimes they might be asked to do a bit more um, and help the spy agencies a little bit more. You know, tip them off if there's a dangerous story or something, or plant a fake story in the press for a political objective of MI5 or MI6. Now, if that sounds fanciful, there is a section in MI6 called IOPS, Information Operations, which does precisely that. Um, then, of course, there are the interconnections at a higher level, you know, between our senior politicians, the owners of the corporations, the editors. And they're all, you know, it's the great British class system. They're all, you know, part of the same clubs and good chaps together, and they all help each other out. So that's the soft power, the control of the media in the UK. The hard power is a barrage of different laws that they can use against journalists and threaten them with. Not just the Official Secrets Act, but in the UK, journalists can be prosecuted under the OSA, as well as whistleblowers. And they face two years in prison as well. Even in Russia, I've heard, journalists will not be prosecuted for covering whistleblower stories. They might get shot, but you know, they won't get prosecuted. There's that. There's uh, the counter-terrorism laws have been used against journalists. The libel laws are used against journalists to stifle these sort of disclosures. Um, they have uh, a voluntary censorship system called the D-Notice Committee, where the media and the spies sit round a table, discuss a story and say, mm, would you mind not covering that for now? It's a bit embarrassing on the chat. Um, and we also have injunctions where the media is censored from covering stories. And we have this wonderful thing in British law called a super injunction, where if the media is gagged, they can't even report they have been gagged, such as has happened during Dave's trial, where the media was not allowed to mention the Gaddafi plot. So all these different laws are in place to stifle the free flow of information about sensitive government work, spy work, military work, and particularly to censor whistleblowers and to frighten journalists off the stories. So this is why when I first heard of the, the model that is WikiLeaks, I just thought it was so blindingly obvious. I was, you know, of course it's a revolutionary idea, it was fantastic. Because here, you cut out that blockage, the, the sort of narrowing down the potential censorship and control of the old media, and the whistleblower can give the documents to WikiLeaks, and the people can read the raw intelligence. That is precisely what we should have in a democracy, surely, for an informed citizenry that can make informed decisions about what sort of government they want to lead them. Now, of course, we all know what's happened to WikiLeaks. It was way too dangerous to allow that to continue successfully. One of the other lessons I pulled out from the whistleblowing years was um, what it's like to live with no sense of privacy. Because during the whistleblowing years, we knew we were being pursued by the spies. We knew that our homes were bugged, that our telephones were bugged, our emails were bugged. We knew the capabilities as well. And everything we're hearing now from the Snowden disclosures, or a lot of it, was technically just about capable in the 1990s, so we were trying to circumvent it even then. It was just, it had to be targeted then. It couldn't just be a blanket surveillance that we're having with Snowden, uh, Snowden's disgust. Um, but it's very corrosive, so no privacy in your home, and the sense as well that you can't talk to your family securely if you're living abroad. Or some of your friends might be coerced into reporting back on you, and we know that happened too. And it's corrosive to the human spirit to live where you can't discuss things freely, or read or watch things freely, or anything like that. Very, very difficult. And it becomes ingrained in the way that you think about how you do things, and also how you deal with people, how you trust people or not. And that, again, to the human spirit, is very difficult. And I think that is what we are all facing now. Thanks to Snowden, we know the sheer scale of this lack of privacy. And we don't have privacy, we cannot have a freely functioning democracy, because we end up self-censoring both what we say and what we write, and what we view, and what we communicate. And if our governments become oppressive, or if we want to activate against them, we cannot freely organise via our communications, because we know we're going to be watched. Even if we're not doing anything wrong now, that information can be stored and used against us in the future if they change the laws. Now, if that sounds fanciful, that's already happening in the UK, where the Occupy movement in the City of London a few years ago was deemed by the City of London police to be not protesters, but domestic extremists or terrorists. So you're out there with a placard and suddenly you're a terrorist. We all know what happens to terrorist suspects these days. So finally as well, um, I just want to draw a few lessons. I mean, living through those years, knowing what it's like to face the pressures of whistleblowing, the, the isolation of it, the um, encroaching and corrosive distrust that takes you over, the paranoia that you really have to battle to control. Um, and also the 
immediate turning your life inside out. You become unemployable anywhere else. You, you know, no other big corporation. You're going to lose your standard, your salary, your way of life. And because of that, you might lose your home, you might lose your family, everything. You lose your entire way of life. And then also, if you're coming out of the intelligence agencies, you also face automatic prosecution in prison too. So it's a very big step to take. And I've had the pleasure of working with many whistleblowers, and many of them are friends now, particularly through an organization called the Sam Adams Associates, where we have whistleblowers from all the major intelligence agencies in America and across Europe. And they've all been through the same trajectory, you know, the, the anger, the, the fight, the um, court case, the, the fear, the paranoia, and then the depression, the financial insecurity. How do you get through that? So I've seen so many slump into the sort of slough of despond. And some of us do survive, but some do get crushed by that process. So there are many groups now coming out internationally and nationally, offering support networks to whistleblowers, not just from the intelligence agencies, from every sector. And it's great to see them all doing this, because the isolation is one of the hardest things to deal with. And if, if it can be seen to future potential whistleblowers that people are out there providing legal help, experience, psychological help, social support, then it makes it a less frightening, less isolating experience to contemplate doing yourself. So there are many, many groups doing this. Unfortunately, what we're seeing is that they're all doing it independently, and they are reinventing the wheel every time. So one of the new um, outfits that I'm helping to set up at the moment, and this is working with a very old friend of mine called Simon Davies. I don't know how many of you might know him. He's the founder of Privacy International and the founder of the Big Brother Awards, um, which have spread across Europe, I gather. Anyway, he, he and I are now working on something called Code Red, which is going, first of all, to be a sort of pool of expertise and experience from all these different social campaigning activist groups to become a sort of clearinghouse, to make it easier for people to activate, for, to avoid the common pitfalls, the common mistakes, and become much more effective much more quickly. And also, what we want to do is set up a more of a support infrastructure network for future potential whistleblowers to help them and to show them that it is possible indeed to survive the process. So I think thinking of the theme of this conference, networked disruption, I would say that Code Red is by the very definition exactly that. We are trying to pull all these different groups together and through many become stronger and to give the whistleblowers the last regulators of resort a fighting chance because they're up against the big boys and the bad guys. Thank you very much.